Hello everyone and welcome to the um, 2020 grantee meeting. Over the course of the next two days we're going to be hearing from lots of great researchers and academics um, who are really pushing the field forward. But we want to begin many of these sessions by talking to some of the people who are really at the heart of it, the patients, the patient advocates, and the people who are at the heart of all the research that we're doing. And we're happy to start the day off with two great people here, Frances Saldana, who I'm sure many of you know, she's the President Emeritus of HD Care, and Carissa Brown, who's the Regional Manager at COPE, which is a health scholars program. And before this, she was the Program Director for Arch Care, a long-term care uh, facility for people with Huntington's disease. And uh, Francis, if we can start with you, tell us a bit about your story, because there's one I think that really captures the kind of the, the cruelty of this particular Huntington's disease. Yeah, so um, I'm Francis Aldana, and um, the father of my children had Huntington's disease. All three of my children inherited the mutant protein for Huntington's. Um, when he was sick, uh, there was really no treatment or any um, significant um, medications for his, for his uh, symptoms. So I was devastated and broken. As it turned out, um, after he died in 1989, all three of my children started showing symptoms uh, for Huntington's. Uh, at that point, I could no longer afford to just be broken. I had to get up off the floor and start trying to learn everything I could about the disease and also to uh, learn about resources that might be out there for, for Huntington's. It was around um, the mid 90s when I met Dr. Leslie Thompson. Uh, at that point, I felt at a loss. There was really nothing for HD patients as far as I could tell. And it wasn't until I learned about her work with Huntington's disease that I felt that I had some sense of direction. I felt like I had an anchor to hold on to for hope, for a treatment, that a treatment might save my children from this devastating and fatal disease. And over the course of the years, what, you found that that wasn't available, right? That, that the treatment just wasn't there. It wasn't there, but with, through research, there was a lot of hope for a treatment. And I always, I still hope that we will have one in my lifetime. Carissa, you've worked a lot with, with people with Huntington's. How do, you, how do you reassure them? How do you help them at a time where really there isn't not only a cure, but really any effective treatment? That's a great question. I think it's a very challenging situation in working with so many uh, patients that are afflicted by it, and not just the, the people that are afflicted by it, but their caregivers. It's, it's very important to come from a place of support and understanding. Since this is so, uh, there's very little resources, by the way, of really understanding how to approach it, especially from a long-term care sense, or how to approach this with a quality of life. It really takes a village, and it takes a community of individuals, very much like the, the folks that are together right now, either watching this or the folks that are really working together on the front lines, so to speak, um, through through these caregiver board excuse me, through the board and through caregiver supports, it really comes as a community. And you really have to understand how to approach a person and also with a dignified way. In the past, working in long-term care and working with folks with Huntington's disease, there's a sense of hope, but there's also a sense of hopelessness. And really working in the middle of those two feelings, it's a really uncomfortable space, but it's a space that needs to be addressed so that folks really understand there are advocates out there. We are working every day. We are making it known that there needs to be a cure. And while there's not a cure, there are supports. And it's really finding those supports and finding those people, those gem, those gemstones, very much like Francis, um, that's really going to push forward and advocate on and really bringing that sense of community on how can we come together for this population? How can we come together for the progression of this? Because we know the progression is inevitable. And it's really taking a stance, a really empathetic and compassionate stance. How do we work together? How do we advocate? How do we educate? And bringing that awareness to the community is your very first step in supporting. Great, Francis, um, since 
all this began, you've become a great patient advocate, a great champion for research into Huntington's disease. How, how did that come about and what, what, what have you been able, do you feel, to achieve by doing that? Well, you know, while trying to uh, find resources and um, educating myself about Huntington's, I, I was really just running around in circles until it was around 2007. Uh, I attended a CIRM meeting with my daughter Margie. And at that point, I remember when I saw the presenters, Hans Kierstad, Dr. Pacifici, Bob Klein, and others, and I heard what they had to say about stem cell research. I, I knew at that moment that there were gonna be some great things happening through stem cell research. And that just gave me more courage and more energy to, to keep fighting for my children who were still living at that time. So it was just incredible um, what has happened in the last, as far as I know, the last 20 years with stem cell, but I didn't learn about it until 2007. And what do you say when people come to you? Because obviously you're kind of a kind of a pivotal figure in, in the support groups. Um, when people come to you, parents come to you and they talk about the, the loved one, a child of theirs perhaps who's been diagnosed. How, what do you say to them? How do you reassure them? You know, I, I always tell them to have hope, uh, also to educate themselves about the symptoms of Huntington's disease because family members historically have been, uh, they, they call it the, the disease of shame because they don't understand the symptoms and they believe that their person is, uh, their loved one is, is uh, losing their mind or they're acting in a way that is embarrassing because of the, the cognitive uh, uh, decline and so forth. So I explained to them that, you know, um, they're dying, they're dying. We need to treat them with respect and dignity and give them the kind of care that you would give any other person who is dying from a fatal disease. And while we're in this moment, you know, be in the moment and create happy times for them, happy, make happy memories for them. And at the same time, you're giving, you're making happy memories for yourself. And this is what I try to do for my children. I, 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 I focused on providing spirituality, meaningful social interaction, care, and um, just to make life as happy as I could, but never losing hope that there would be a treatment. But knowing all the time that time was, my, my children were in a race against time. And, you know, they lost the race, but I'm still here. So in, in memory of my children, I continue with, on their behalf for their courageous fight to advocate and, and to fight for a, a treatment for Huntington's disease. Carissa, I mean, Huntington's is a rare disease. Most people may have heard of it, but know very little about it. Um, how do you raise awareness? How do you educate people so that they have a better understanding that this is something that could happen to anyone? So I think upon the time when even I didn't know what Huntington's disease was, but I knew very much like Francis had said, it is a race against time, and I had lost a father to a rare neurodegenerative disease. And I know the feeling and the impact of talking with, with people or even practitioners that are unaware of the progression of a disease state and what that, how that impacts you negatively. And that gave me a really empathetic approach with how can I raise awareness to communities on Huntington's disease so that going back to the comment about the disease of shame, let's lean in to what the symptoms are and why they're happening. And you really do that through advocacy. And even if you have limited resources, using your voice, uh, the power of words, the power of storytelling and the power of connection is exactly how I was able to build a program I was able to generate awareness. I was able to develop partnerships all in the name of this is a person here, her story. This is a person here, his story. And then these stories generate and the awareness grows. And as that grows and expands, you get more and more people interested in how can I help? And when people are willing to help because now they understand, now you're creating a connection that we can actually be the conduit to moving toward hopefully a cure, but if no cure, interventions 
that can give people a better quality of life as they're ailing with this as they progress. Francis, if we could end with you, where you talk about how you got involved in, in the research and everything like that, you're really heavily involved now with, I know, with Leslie Thompson and some of the other researchers out there. How important is it for researchers to have a champion like you, to have people kind of advocating on their behalf so that they feel like the work they're doing is not just important, but that they have a lot of people behind them? It, it's very important because uh, while they're doing their research and trying to develop clinical trials, uh, if they don't have the patients to participate in these trials, well, we're just, you know, it's a no, it's a no win for anybody. So patients need to be educated. They need to not be afraid to come forward either to, um, you know, they can come forward anonymously, but they need to participate because that's the only way we're going to uh, have a treatment. Uh, otherwise, you know, this could go on forever and, and, uh, and have no treatment for, for our loved ones. Do you feel hopeful? I'm very hopeful. Yeah, I'm very hopeful. I, I know I've been saying since, uh, since 2000 that we'd have a treatment in two years. And then after two years, I said, oh, another two years. And then I said five years and then seven. Now I really feel that it'll be here in two years. <laughs> That's a great note to end this on. Well, Francis, Carissa, thank you both so much for joining us and helping us get this, off, this meeting off to a great start. Thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.